Cheryl. This morning, as we return in our study uh, to the Gospel of Mark, I want to begin uh, by directing your attention to another passage of the Old Testament. I just want to put things a little bit into perspective from a first century viewpoint, thinking about things from the perspective of the disciples and the people of Israel in the days when Jesus showed up. There is a promise in 2 Samuel 7 that a greater son of David will come and the Lord will establish his kingdom permanently. That it'll be a kingdom of uh, kingdoms. This is part of the messianic hope of Israel. Psalm 2 is one of the psalms where it talks about the absolute sovereignty of this kingdom. Uh, In fact, if we just pick up in uh, verse 4 of Psalm 2, it says, He who sits in the heavens laughs, the Lord scoffs at them, that is, against the nations that are in an uproar and angry about God establishing an authority over them. But it's, He who sits in the heavens that laughs, the Lord scoffs at them, and he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. Zion is a reference, obviously, to Israel. And my king is a king that God establishes in Israel, but it's not just over Israel. Notice in verse 7, I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will surely give you the nations as your inheritance. Notice that this is a sovereign king over Israel that God establishes. And he establishes him not just over the land of Israel, but over the nations. Ask of me and I will surely or most certainly give you the nations as your inheritance, the very ends of the earth as your possession. So this is a promise of the messianic rule being over the whole world. And here's where we get probably the most famous passage is verse 9. You shall break them with a rod of iron and shatter them like earthenware ruling with a rod of iron this is where that idea comes from that the messiah comes he's going to establish his kingdom and he's going to rule with a rod of iron what does it mean to rule with a rod of iron uh, a rod uh, referring to the exercise of a, the authority and putting down those who rebel and a rod of iron meaning a very strong rod that doesn't break absolute powerful sovereign unbreakable authority Therefore, O king, show discernment, take warning, O judges of the earth. And by the way, keep in mind that when we talk about judges in an Old Testament context, we're not talking about guys in black robes sitting up with a gavel going guilty or innocent. Okay, When we talk about judges, we're talking about guys like Gideon and Jephthah and Barak and Samson, the, those who ruled uh, the nation of Israel. Rulers is really the idea. A judge is just a ruler. Uh, Moses was a judge of Israel. He was a prophet. He spoke for God and he basically was the one God ordained to exercise authority for him over the nation of Israel. Kings of the earth show discernment. Judges take warning. Worship the Lord with reverence. Rejoice with trembling. Do or pay homage to the Son so that he may not become angry and you perish in the way because his wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are all who take refuge in him. Now these are the kinds of passages and we could look at several, but these are the kinds of passages in the Old Testament that present that idea that the the. The greater David, the son of David, who is going to be the anointed of the Lord, who's going to come, he's going to establish a kingdom. He's going to subjugate not just the authorities in Israel beneath his authority. He's going to uh, subject all the nations under his authority. He's going to establish a kingdom that he rules personally with absolute power and authority on God's behalf. Now, that's the messianic hope of Israel. That's what Peter, James, John, and the rest of the disciples are looking for. 
when Jesus shows up. That's what the nation of Israel and the leaders of Israel are looking for when Jesus shows up. They're looking for the Messiah to be the one who speaks for God, who acts for God, who is anointed by the Spirit of God and able to do great things in God's name and who establishes a kingdom for Israel above all other kingdoms. That's what they're looking for. You know why they're looking for that? Because that's exactly what God promised. That's exactly what God promised. And it's going to happen. The challenge in the Gospels is that the disciples and the people of Israel are looking for that to happen when he shows up the first time. And when you get to Mark chapter 8, where we were at a couple of weeks ago, verse 27, Jesus has been doing all these miracles. He's been doing his his, uh, ministry for years. He's at the height of his popularity. But the religious leaders have already rejected him and they are plotting and looking for a way to, uh, uh, to execute him. And he asked the disciples in verse 27, he says, who do people say that I am? One of the disciples give a number of answers. Some say John the Baptist, back from the dead, right? Some say that you're Elijah. Some say that you're one of the other prophets of old back. And so you're clearly from God and you clearly speak for God. Then he continued and said, but who do you say that I am? And Peter stood up and said, you are the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one of God. Now, you look at the other Gospels and you can see that Jesus actually commends Peter for this. In fact, he says, you didn't figure this out on your own. My father revealed this to you. He goes on to make some other statements about the kingdom. And then he warns them to tell nobody about him. Don't use that term. Don't tell anybody that I'm the Messiah. In fact, when you go through the Gospels, have you ever noticed that It's not until Jesus is on trial other than the one conversation that he has in John 4 with the woman at the well who is a Samaritan, not even a Jew. Jesus never uses the term Messiah in reference to himself. Have you noticed that? You ever wonder why that is? I still remember when I first got saved, I'm reading through the the Bible and I'm looking to see Jesus confirm that he's the Messiah and he just never does. He keeps using this term, the Son of God, the Son, or excuse me, the Son of Man, the Son of Man, the Son of Man, the Son of Man. A couple of times the term Son of God is used, but primarily what is used over and over again that, that Jesus uses in reference to himself is the title, the Son of Man. Why does he do that? Well, by the time you get around to reading Daniel, I mean, it's a long way from Genesis to Daniel when you're a new believer. You, you know what I'm saying? By the time you get to Daniel, you notice that it, there's the statement about the Ancient of Days and the Son of Man who receives authority from the Ancient of Days. And you go, oh, he's using that prophetic title. And I had heard some preachers to say that Son of Man refers to his humanity and Son of God refers to his deity. And that's a little simplistic and incomplete. Jesus doesn't primarily use the term son of man just to refer to his humanity. He's using the term son of man tied back to Daniel, identifying himself as the one that God is going to give full authority on the earth to. But he's very deliberate about not using the term Mashiach, not using the term Messiah or Christ, Christos. Why? Because everybody in Jesus's day was expecting the Messiah to show up and establish his kingdom. And Jesus came first to offer himself up as that once for all sacrifice for sins. Now, let me ask you a question. Did Jesus have the right and the authority to come the first time and just establish his kingdom? Yes. But if he does that, if he does not first come as the suffering servant and die in our place, he establishes a kingdom that we can live in for a period of time. And then when we die, what do we have to do? We have to answer for our sins. See, Jesus didn't just come to fulfill those kingdom promises. Jesus came first to offer himself up as the suffering servant, as the once for all sacrifice for our sins, so that a way could be made for our sins to be forgiven so that we could have a part in this kingdom. 
It's an amazing demonstration of God's grace, God's love, God's mercy, God's favor, God's kindness. Well, the disciples don't understand this. And so when Jesus says, uh, well, here it says, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ. He warns them to tell no one about him so that that t- term isn't bantered about until after he has died and risen from the dead. In verse 31, he then began to teach them, saying that the Son of Man, notice there's that title again, must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, be killed and after three days rise again. Why? Why does he begin to tell them this? Because this is what's about to happen. From this point on, he is headed toward Jerusalem to offer himself up as a sacrifice for our sins. In Luke chapter 9, the parallel to this, to this passage, this general passage that we're in right now, it literally says this is when Jesus fixed his face to go to Jerusalem. From this point on, he's looking at the cross. He is aiming for the cross. And he's preparing the disciples now. All the miracles he's done up to this point have demonstrated his power, demonstrated his identity. Proven the grace of God, the mercy of God. He's shown that he has the ability to cure every sickness, cure every disease, cure every affliction, cast out every demon, control uh, creation, the weather, walk on the sea, raise the dead. He's proven all of that now. At this point, it is time for him to go and provide the way of salvation and forgiveness for us through the cross. And in preparing the disciples, he says, don't tell anybody Uh, about me that I'm the Christ don't use that term the son of man must first suffer many things be rejected by the leadership in Israel be killed and after three days rise again when he gets done telling them that remember that Peter pulls him aside and begins to rebuke him Peter or excuse me Jesus it's not going to be that way that's pretty audacious wouldn't you agree Sometimes we look at Peter's behavior and go, that is just so outlandish. I can't believe he would do that. Sometimes I think we need to look in the mirror and realize how many ways we do those kinds of things as well. But it wasn't just Peter. When we get to the upper room, uh, in fact, if you, if you look at the parallels in Luke's gospel in the upper room, you'll see that Jesus not only quotes from Isaiah 53 saying that's all going to be fulfilled today, Uh, tonight and tomorrow which is what happens you read Isaiah 53 along with Luke's gospel and you will see the events of the cross basically walk right through Isaiah 53 it all happens just like God said it was going to happen 700 years beforehand well when they're still in the upper room before they leave Jesus makes this declaration he says tonight the scripture will be fulfilled the shepherd will be struck and the sheep will be scattered and Peter goes Nuh-uh. You ever see the emperor's new groove? That's always what I think of when I think of that. Nuh-uh, uh-huh, nuh-uh, uh-huh, nuh-uh. I mean, that's because that's, that's the sound that I hear in my heart when I read that. Peter is going, listen, Jesus, you're wrong. The scriptures are wrong. No way, no how do I fall away. And by the way, before you, before you go, well, what a buffoon Peter is, the rest of the disciples, after Peter says it first, the rest of the disciples kick in and go, yeah, we won't fall away either. Imagine that. Jesus is hours from the cross, and his disciples are arguing with him about whether what the Bible says is actually true and whether what he says is actually true. Pretty amazing, isn't it? Just shows that the truthfulness of Scripture When the apostles afterwards write about the events, they're honest and truthful about portraying themselves in their own sinfulness, in their own arrogance, in their own frailties, in their own humanities. This is a truthful account. And when Jesus begins to instruct them very clearly about what is in store for him when he gets to Jerusalem, they don't take it well because it does not at all fit with their theology. And the reason it doesn't fit with their theology is because they have read the Old Testament and they got half of it right. They just read past the other half that was unfathomable to them that the Messiah would first come as the suffering servant and lay his life down for us. That he would be uh, led like a lamb to the slaughter. And like a sheep before its shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. 
and the iniquities of us all were laid upon him. They just, there's no way to make the connection of those dots until after it happens and you look back and God opens your mind and you go, oh my goodness, it all got fulfilled exactly like God said. I would have never expected that, but that's exactly what happened. Well, Jesus has told his disciples, you are right about who I am, and here's the way it's going to play out. They didn't accept that, so then Jesus, in verse 34 of Mark chapter 8, takes the disciples and summons the crowd together with his disciples. And he says to them, if anybody wishes to come after me, he's got to deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. We looked last time at what that means. What does it mean to to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow him? To deny yourself means you say no to you. To take up your cross means that you are willing, you say no to you, even if it's going to cost you your life. And you do what? You keep on following him. That's the requirement. That's what it costs to be a disciple. Now, that's a pretty high cost, wouldn't you agree? And especially when Jesus is going to pay that cost in going to to the cross for us. He who knew no sin, God made to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That's what he's going to face. And he calls us to take up our crosses and follow him. That's a pretty amazing high expectation. Wouldn't you agree? Especially when I've seen no indication of the kingdom. And everything I'm looking forward to with with regard to the kingdom is a glorious future where God's people are raised up above all the nations. Amazing promises. In fact, he says, whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will, will save it. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what will a man give in exchange for his soul? You remember, we went through the details of this and we saw very clearly what is Jesus saying? Whatever it is that is more important to you in this life than eternal life, that's the price tag you put on your soul. Having that, having your autonomy, having that sin, having that ambition, having that whatever it is in this life, that you wanted more than you were, that you weren't willing to give up in order to be reconciled to God, that's the price tag you put on your soul. When you stand before God in judgment, you won't have any way to buy it back. And that will be the price tag, that that will be what you sold your soul for. Why? Because whoever is ashamed of me and my words, verse 38, in this adulterous and sinful generation... The Son of Man will also be ashamed of Him when He comes in the glory of His Father with His holy angels. You can be sure of this. When the Son of Man comes in the glory of His Father with the holy angels, your standing before God and your place in the kingdom will have already been determined based upon how you responded to this call of Christ to forsake all and follow Him. Very high calling. Very, very costly invitation. Agreed? You want a right relationship with God? You've got to be willing to give up everything. Look at chapter 9 and verse 1, the introduction to our text that we're looking at this morning. And Jesus was saying to them, which means this is the the closing part of that same conversation, that same instruction that he gave to his disciples and to the crowds that were following him. He was saying to them, truly, I say to you, there are some of those who are standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. Now, there's a little bit of a challenge with regard to the end of that because it's a perfect tense verb that just isn't easy to bring into English after it has come with power I think the King James said makes it a present tense Uh, the kingdom come with power something along those lines till they see the kingdom of God come with power it's just really difficult to convey the idea into English but it basically means see the kingdom having come in a way that in a demonstrates what it looks like okay it's a it's a display of the kingdom having come with power 
This is one of the reasons the, the challenges related to translating that perfect tense verb are one of the reasons why there's, there are interpretive issues discussed about this together with a bunch of other things. But at the end of the day, what Jesus is saying, and notice it's emphatic, he says truly, or your Bible may say verily, or most certainly, or something along those lines. It's actually the word amen in the Greek. It's just an emphatic way to affirm that you agree with something, or you believe something, or something is true. And as with preachers today, so too in Jesus' day, all the teachers, preachers, rabbis, etc., they all waited for the listener to add an amen to what they said, right? Or at the end of a prayer, you say, amen, so let it be. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm really affirming emphatically that this is, this is what I'm praying. Or, or when I get done preaching and I say a point that's really strong, you go, amen, meaning you agree with it. Yes, that's true. I affirm that. But as is typical of Jesus he doesn't, he doesn't close off what he says with an amen, and he doesn't wait for people to affirm what he says is true. He starts with it, because what Jesus says is true. This is one of the reasons why the crowds, when they listen to Jesus teach and preach, this is why they said, you know, this guy isn't like everybody else, all the scribes and Pharisees. He preaches as one having authority within himself, which, of course, he does because he's God incarnate. Truly, I say to you, amen, I say to you, verily, I say to you, there are some of those who are standing here who will not taste death. Some of those who are right here present listening to me at this very red hot moment who will not taste death. What's that mean? Will not experience death, won't die until they see the kingdom of God come with power. Or having come with power. Having come and being manifest with power. Now what is he talking about? Well, some uh, have suggested that he's talking about Pentecost. And the outpouring of the Spirit and the manifestation of the gifts. Acts chapter 2. The Holy Spirit comes down. And the apostles immediately are able to speak in foreign languages that they have never learned. They still have a Galilean twang to the way they speak. So you can tell they're from Galilee, but they're speaking other languages, Coptic, Ethiopic, Latin, whatever. Okay, And they're speaking uh, praises to God. And everybody that's from all these lands that have come in for the festival hear them praising God in those languages. And Peter says, this is, we're not drunk like some of you have suggested. This is a demonstration and a fulfillment of Joel and a demonstration of the power of God. And then he goes on and preaches and 3,000 people get saved that day. Some people have said that's that manifestation of power. And certainly there were a few people that were here listening to Jesus, namely the apostles, who were also present in Mark 8 and 9 that are present on the day of Pentecost. Others have suggested that it refers to the whole church age. Some have suggested it points to the death, the burial, and resurrection of Christ. A few have even argued that he's speaking about 70 A.D. and the destruction of the temple. But I think there are a couple of things here that make it very clear that what Jesus is talking about is the text that we're going to be studying this morning, and that is the transfiguration. First of all, and most significantly, is the fact that right after Jesus makes this promise, here in Mark 9 and verse 1, or in the parallels in Luke 9 or Matthew 7, uh, uh, 16, Immediately after that, Matthew 17, Mark 9, and uh, Luke 9, immediately after that in all three Gospels where this event is recorded. And by the way, the fact that all three synoptic Gospels record this event demonstrate that all three authors believe this is a really essential uh, narrative to provide as far as the testimony to Jesus Christ and a message about the Gospel. This is a really important narrative. Because all three of the synoptic writers talk about it. They all record it. And they all record it immediately after Jesus makes this promise. And not only that, they all three record the time frame in which it happened, which is almost immediately. 
Notice in verse 2 of Mark 9, it says, Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, and they went up onto the high mountain, and they saw the Lord transfigured. That transfiguration is that manifestation, that display of glory. Now, I would add to that the fact that uh, the perfect tense of the verb means that you will see the kingdom having come, uh, a manifestation, the result of the kingdom having come within power. And exactly what they see on the mountain, what we're going to walk through, is you will see Jesus displayed in full glorious power. And it won't just be Jesus. It'll be Moses and Elijah together with him, fully glorified, alive, and in his presence talking to him. That is a demonstration of the power of the kingdom, the power of resurrection of the saints of old and their alive and glorious presence with the Lord and the Lord in his full and majestic person. Why would Jesus, why would God give this kind of a manifestation to these disciples in this context? Because he's called upon them to give their lives for him. He's called upon them to follow him all the way even unto death looking forward to the future, and this is a manifestation of what they have to look forward to, that they can attest to. And by the way, uh, one last passage I'll take you to before we start working through Mark 9 is 2 Peter chapter 1. I want you to turn there with me. Go ahead and take your Bibles and turn to 2 Peter chapter 1. The Apostle Peter is one of the three who are going to see the transfiguration we're going to look at here momentarily and I want you to see what he says about it second Peter 1 verse 16 Peter says we did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ notice the stress on the power and coming isn't that what the promise just was that we read in Mark 9 we didn't follow cleverly devised tales. This wasn't a made-up story that we just invented when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of His majesty. We were eyewitnesses who personally saw Him coming in power. What it looks like. What it's going to be. For when He received honor and glory from God the Father, such an utterance as this was made to him by the majestic glory. This is what the Father spoke about Jesus when we saw him manifested in glory. This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. And we ourselves, that's Peter saying in reference to himself and James and John, we ourselves heard this utterance made from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. This is Peter talking about, after the fact, Peter talking about the experience that he had on the Mount of Transfiguration. This is why I'm convinced this is the promise, the fulfillment of the promise that Jesus made in Mark 9.1. If you want to turn back there with me, we'll now look, to, look at our text. Truly I say to you, there are some of those who are standing here right now present with me out of the multitudes and my twelve disciples there are some who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. Having come with power. A demonstration of what the power demonstrated here on this earth looks like. As we, are, as we look at today's text, if you're looking for a title for this morning's message, I have about five of them that you can choose from. The, the, ones, the one I'll be going with is either a glimpse of glory or a picture of power. I think we'll go with a glimpse of glory just by default here, but it's either a glimpse of glory or a picture of power. If you like a topical one, it's the transfiguration. If you want a theological one, it's a proof of the coming kingdom. Any of those will work, but we'll just go with a glimpse of glory. And it's a glimpse of glory that God gives to these disciples. Number one, to strengthen them in their faith. 
in preparation for his death, burial, and resurrection, since at this point they don't believe it and can't possibly understand it, and they are unwilling to accept it. And then afterwards, as they begin, afterwards as they see the resurrection and they, and they, and they see the risen Lord as they live the rest of their lives as his apostles and head straight to death for him as well, this will be a great encouragement that they can always point back to and continually attest to, just like Peter does in 2 Peter 1, to having seen the power of God on display in the coming kingdom as a, as a means to motivate Christians to trust in Christ and to live for Christ, knowing that the kingdom is still coming. You can be sure of it. Jesus makes the promise. He says, truly, I say to you, there are some of those who are standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. And today we see the promised kingdom in in power displayed, verses one and eight, and then discussed in verses nine to 13. This is the promised kingdom displayed in power and discussed in with power in verses 1 through 8 and 9 to 13. Let's start by looking, uh, beginning in verse 2 now, since we've already done verse 1. Let's start in verse 2 and look at the promised, the power of the promised kingdom displayed. The power of the promised kingdom displayed. Verse 2 says, Six days later, Matthew 17, verse 1 says the same thing. That means it's a very historical note. It's deliberate. That both authors are specific in saying this is six days after this promise was made. This happens. Well, why is it stressed that it's such a short time? Because it helps to attach it to the promise that he made. This is the fulfillment of the promise that he made. In Luke 9 and verse 28, Luke says it was about eight days. And that's because Luke includes the day of Peter's confession as well as the day of the transfiguration. All three authors point out how, what a short time it is from the time that Jesus makes this promise until he fulfills it right here with Peter, James, and John. And Jesus takes with him Peter and James and John and brought them up on a high mountain by themselves. It's just the three of them and Jesus. Jesus just takes these three. God, why these three? They're the inner circle. They're the ones out of the 12 that he spent the most time with. They're the ones that he takes in keeping with, uh, with Deuteronomy 17. They are the two or three witnesses that he always has with him uh, to be able after the fact to attest to or testify uh, to the events that they see. In Mark's gospel, we saw that they are the three that Jesus took with him into Jairus' house when he raised Jairus' daughter from the dead. We'll also see in Mark 14, by the end of the time we get to the end of the gospel, that they are the three that Jesus will take with him to pray in the Garden of Gethsemane. So they are his witnesses there as well. And they are the three that he singles out, Peter, James, and John, to take with him up to the mount upon which he will be transfigured and display his glory. Why these three? Well, obviously, he needs, three, he needs somebody to witness it, to write about it. If nobody's there and it happens, then it doesn't become an encouragement to anyone. Secondly, these three guys are the ones that Jesus chose first and invested himself into the most throughout the whole of his earthly ministry. James was the first of the apostles to be martyred for his faith in Christ. Peter was always the first to speak for Christ not only during Christ's earthly ministry, but also on the day of Pentecost. He very much becomes a spokesman for the apostles and for Christ as a result. And John was the last of the living apostles and the one who wrote more of the New Testament than anyone else except for the apostle Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles. These are the three that Jesus poured the most into because he had the most expectations of them. And he brings them up onto a high mountain by themselves. You say, well, which mountain is this? Now, I'm not going to get too much into this. The historical view is Mount Tabor. Uh, and some have argued that that's the case. Most commentators today say that can't be the case. 
Uh, frankly, it's impossible to tell. There aren't footprints that you can chase down. And if there were, they are long since destroyed by the churches that have been built on all, every potential holy site imaginable. The, an alternative view is Mount Hermon. Most of the argument has to do with working through the geography and how far places are uh, and where they are in the travels of Jesus. A number of writers argue against Mount Tabor because Mark 8, 27 says that Jesus was in Caesarea Philippi and therefore uh, it's, uh, Tabor is out of the way. And so they propose Mount Hermon. I think that's the study Bible view as well. Frankly, I think the one thing you can be sure of today is that it's impossible to know for certain. And I don't think that that's incidental. I think that's on purpose. I think there are some of these kinds of historical facts, these kinds of historical details that God has purposefully, the older I get and the more I study, the more convinced I am, especially having gone to Israel and having spent my life in the church now, the... <laughs> The more that God tells us about where specific events take place, the more people tend to reverence the location and lose sight of the significance of who God is and what he did there. And so maybe in your own heart, you can be comfortable with God not telling you and recognizing this in a historical account because we have eyewitness testimonies to it in three Gospels and Peter's own testimony in Second Peter to see that it absolutely did happen and where it happened is less left a mystery for now because otherwise we'd be wanting to go there to be, be close to Jesus or, or feel something because we were on some kind of a special holy site. Frankly, I can remember the awe of standing on the Temple Mount and walking around the Temple precincts. It was pretty amazing. So it's easy to kind of get caught up in the geography. Today, what we want to focus on instead is the majesty of the person of Jesus Christ and the event that actually took place there on that mountain in northern uh, Galilee. It's been six days since Jesus made this promise and he takes the inner circle together with him and he brings them up on a high mountain. They're, they go up by themselves. Now we'll pause here. I want you to take your Bibles and keep your finger in Mark and turn to Luke 9. I wanna, I wanna, we're going to bounce back and forth with this parallel in Luke 9 because there are a few details that are given that will help us to see why some of the things played out the way they did. In Luke 9, starting at verse 28, I hear the pages turning. Luke 9, 28, it's eight, some eight days after these sayings. Notice the round number that Luke is using because he's, he's incorporating all the things that, of the narrative that goes beforehand together. And he takes Peter and John and James. They went up on the mountain. And notice the one insight that Luke gives us here. The reason that Jesus says, the three of you are coming with me up this mountain is why? So that to, in order to pray. They went up on the mountain to pray. And notice it says, while he was praying, the appearance of his face became different. Notice his visible features, his face became different. His clothing became white and gleaming. Behold, two men were talking with him. They were Moses and Elijah. Notice that Luke mentions Moses first and then Elijah, uh, who appearing in glory. These two guys show up in glory, okay? Or the word actually is brilliance or splendor. They were all lit up as well. And they were speaking about his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. So you see that Moses and Elijah show up. They're also shining in glory. They're having a conversation, the three of them. And what are they talking about? Jesus going to Jerusalem to accomplish his departure. Isn't that an interesting way to refer to it? His exit from this life, his departure from this earth and return to heaven. He's talking about the consummation of redemptive history and finishing his work on the cross and going back to heaven. That's the discussion that he's having with Moses and Elijah. Now, here's again where we get a taste of the humanity of the disciples. Verse 32, Peter and his companions had been overcome with sleep. <laughs> We're going to see the same thing when we get to the Garden of Gethsemane. When he says, uh, stay up and pray for me, and what do they do? 
they fall asleep. This, listen, this is what happens when you fall asleep during a prayer meeting. You miss cool stuff. But anyways, <laughs> verse 32, when they were fully awake, you know what that means? They go up onto the mountain. He takes them up on the mountain. They begin to pray. Jesus is still praying, and they have fallen asleep. Well, while they're asleep, guess who shows up? Moses and Elijah. Guess what happens to Jesus? He's manifested in full glory. They're sleeping through all of this. Okay? E- ever, ever fall asleep in the middle of movie night and then go, what happened at the end? Who did, right? And you got to rewind. Okay, well, there's no rewind here. They just wake up and they catch the end of the conversation. You ever notice when you're asleep during a movie or something and you kind of half hear it and then you wake up and you're trying to mentally connect the dots? All right, that's what happened. Peter and his companions, Peter, James, and John, had been overcome with sleep. When they were fully awake, they saw his glory. They open their eyes and they wake up and they see the two men standing with him. Okay. That's the background. Luke gives us all those details. Now go back to Mark 9. Keep your finger there in Luke 9. Did I just tell you too late? (laughs) Mark 9, verse 2. Jesus brings them up on a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. Now notice how Mark skips all those details. Remember, Mark is based on Peter's preaching. Doesn't mean it didn't happen. Doesn't mean the counts don't agree. It's just there are other details that Luke has put in there from interviewing uh, the other apostle, John, who was still alive at the time. And he was transfigured before them. That word transfigured in Mark 2, uh, verse 2, or excuse me, Mark 9, verse 2. uh, That word transfigured is where we get the English word metamorphosis from. It's the same word that Paul uses, by the way, when he's talking in Romans 12 and verse 2. He says, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. And he says, be transformed, transfigured, uh, changed by the renewing of your mind, totally transformed, totally altered by the renewing of your mind. They go through a metamorphosis. That's the word. In that case, it's a, it's a transformed thinking. In this case, it's a transformation of the, of the physical person of Jesus Christ and his manifestation. He, Jesus, was transfigured before them. A metamorphosis had happened to Jesus, and they saw the effects of it. And the description that's given here in Mark 9.3 is that his garments became radiant and exceedingly white as no launderer on earth can whiten them. His garments became radiant. You know what it means when something is radiant? We use the term sometimes to talk about somebody being excited. You know, when you say, oh, yeah, we're going to have pizza tonight. And the kids would just their faces would light up. You know, we talk about that way. Right. Or. Or, or maybe it's Pastor Appreciation Day and suddenly a box of cookies shows up and I open it up and sure enough, it's chocolate chip cookies and my whole countenance brightens, right? Now, by the way, that was not a push for any of that. I'm just, I'm just saying it might have happened. It might have been really cool when it did. Not, not, nothing else. I don't need any more cookies, thanks. But my point is, that we talk about things brightening and brightening and radiating. Okay, well, in Jesus' case, on this occasion, it was literal. It's absolutely literal. His, his garments became radiant. His garment, the, even the clothing that he was wearing was shining. It was illuminated. Exceedingly white. Okay, brilliant, flashing, like, like just a sparkles almost. I hate to use that term because we think of like, like uh, rhinestones or whatever, I, but it really is just that idea of just a, a, an illumination, a radiance, a glow, a visible glow. And notice that the stress that Peter has in his preaching that Mark is recording here, is specifically on the garments. If you were to look at both Matthew and, like we saw just a moment ago in Luke 9, Matthew 17 and Luke 9, both talk about Jesus' face shining. 
What, 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 what they record is about his physical body shining. But what hit Peter most strongly was that even the garments were shining. And the idea of as no launderer on earth can whiten them, just a clarification, launderer is a pretty poor translation. Fuller is closer, but it's not, it's not just the idea of, it, it's certainly not the idea of somebody who washes dirty clothes. It's not like Jesus sw- uh, w- stopped by the dry cleaners on the way up the mountain and then went down and picked them up while the disciples were sleeping, okay? This isn't so, like a laundry cycle. The idea here is somebody who prepares bolts of cloth, washes them, and bleaches them. When you go to the store, okay, you go to Dillard's or wherever, okay, you go there and you see all those dress shirts hanging on the rack. They are as white as they are ever going to be, right? You take them to the cleaners, you just hope that they get them as white as they were when you bought them new. That's the idea. It's not a cleaning toward they're really new. This is, this is the, Jesus' garments were so white, they were whiter than anybody on earth could make cloth. That's his idea. That's the expression. He was transfigured before them, and his garments became radiant, shined with brilliant light, exceedingly white, so white that it's, 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 not, it's not like he had like super white clothing. It's way past that. Notice in verse 4 it says, Elijah appeared to them along with Moses and they were talking with Jesus. You'll notice in Mark's gospel that Elijah is men- mentioned first instead of Moses. And a lot of people get into the discussion about who's more important, Moses or Elijah. Do you know who's more important in this account? Jesus, okay, why is Elijah listed first here? Because immediately following these verses, when we get to the second half of our text this morning, you'll see there's a discussion about Elijah. That's why there's a focus on Elijah literally showing up, because then the disciples are going to say, why do the scribes say Elijah has to show up? And by the way, he just did, right? He literally just did show up. So that's all part of what prompts them to ask. Well, that's why he's mentioned first here. Elijah appeared to them along with Moses. You say, well, how do they know it's Moses and Elijah? It's not that Jesus tells them afterwards, because if you continue to read in the text, you'll notice in verse 5, Peter says, Rabbi, it's good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles. Or three booths, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He obviously knows who the, each of them are, right? Well, how? They've never met Moses or Elijah before. The original scrolls of the Torah and of the Old Testament prophets, they're not picture books, right? There, there was no Zondervan illustrated pictorial encyclopedia for them to check in and say, oh, yeah, that looks like, just like Moses. You know, when I was growing up, we had football cards. I don't know if they still have them, but, but, you know, you had pictures of your favorite players. Yeah, so Peter remembered because he had the Moses card and always wanted to trade for the Elijah card, and John wouldn't trade with him. No. How, how do they know? Well, I, I remind you what isn't in Mark 9 but is in Luke 9. You know what it is? They wake up hearing the conversation. And having heard the conversation bits and pieces and then waking up and realizing what's on display in front of them. Okay, and imagine how bright this must be that night as they're up on the mountain over the night. Okay, and uh, the light that shines from Moses, the light that shines from Elijah, the light that shines on Jesus. And they've fallen asleep as Jesus is praying. And they start to come to hearing the conversation and they're hearing bits and pieces of the conversation. Well, somehow they put it together, whether they heard Jesus use their names or they use each other's name or whatever. They realize exactly who these guys are. It's Moses and Elijah. And they're talking with Jesus. Notice that Mark doesn't point out what they were talking about. But. Luke does. And what does Luke tell us? They're talking about Jesus' pending departure. They're talking about Jesus as he heads the rest of the way to Jerusalem and offers himself up for our sins. 
and his death, burial, resurrection, and ultimately ascension back to heaven where they will be. He's talking about fulfilling the plans. He's talking about the consummation of redemptive history that he is going to secure when when he gets to Jerusalem. Now, I have a lot here that writers have argued about why is it Moses and why is it Elijah? Some have argued that Moses is, represents the law and Elijah the prophets. And it is true that Moses wrote the law, uh, Genesis through Deuteronomy, but Elijah didn't write any of the scriptures. Uh, Elijah wasn't one of the writing prophets, so I don't think that fits. Others have suggested that these are the two Old Testament saints that had a unique departure. Remember from the end of Deuteronomy, uh, when, uh, when Moses gets to the end of his life, he's still strong, he's still fit, but God says, hand all this over to Joshua and come with me. And then we're told that Moses' body was never found. And so God must have done something special with him. And Elijah, we know, was taken to heaven in a fiery chariot. So they are chosen because they are the two that had a, 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 a very unique and miraculous exit. Well, I don't, I don't want to be you know, argumentative here, but I have read all the way through Genesis 5, and Enoch walked with God, and he was not because God took him. And that's the first guy that has a pretty amazing exit from life. So these are the two dust doesn't fit for me. Others tie it back to the roles of Jesus and John the Baptist. Uh, Jesus is the prophet like unto Moses that was promised. Uh, and um, John is the Elijah that was to come, according to Jesus, at least if you will accept it. And so that's where those two are tied, Malachi 4 and Deuteronomy 8. There's certainly a, a degree to which that's true. Others have suggested, and this is the creative one I just can't help but share, Others have suggested that Mark 9 and verse 1 says you're going to get a taste of what the kingdom is going to be like. So Moses is representative of all the Old Testament saints who died because he's there in the flesh, alive in glory and communicating with Jesus. Elijah is uh, an evidence of what it'll be like for those saints like Elijah who get transferred out in some special way whether it's Enoch and Elijah in the Old Testament or New Testament saints that get raptured Elijah is representative of those who transition out and don't actually die and Peter James and John then represent those who will be alive at the time the kingdom is established and then Jesus obviously is representative of himself pretty creative I don't think it's the point I think the reason these two prophets return and are recognized by the disciples is because Moses is the, the uh, one that God chose to give the law through. And Elijah is the one that was promised to return. And when you, when you look at the promise that Jesus made in Mark 9 and verse 1, what was the promise? Some of those who are here are going to get to see what the kingdom is like when it has come in power. You know what the kingdom is like? The saints of God are there alive and in glory. And so is Jesus in full power. Moses and Elijah are unique prophets in the Old Testament. They do represent, in a sense, the beginning and the ending of the Old Testament revelation of God's plan. The Old Testament begins with the law of Moses. And the prophets end with a promise from Malachi that Elijah will come and restore the hearts of the people. As a side note here, and we're not going to go through this, I do think the promise, we'll, we'll get into this in some more detail before we close, but I do think Malachi 4, 5 is uh, not only fulfilled if you will accept it in uh, John the Baptist. I'm convinced that there's also still the fulfillment of that that is yet when Christ comes in power. 
And I would not be surprised, I don't, I'm not saying you have to conclude this, but I wouldn't be surprised if Elijah is one of the two witnesses of Revelation 11. And if you want, you can get the tape that we did, or however you get messages nowadays, you can get that uh, from Revelation 11 when I did that. I, it's not a few years ago anymore, but some time ago. And they're talking to Jesus about his preparation for leaving, heading to Jerusalem and departing basically back to glory, according to Luke 9. And at this point, Peter says to Jesus, Rabbi, it's good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And you'll notice the clarification. This is, I love the honesty of the Bible. Why did he say this? Well, we're not actually told what provoked him here in Mark. Luke tells us in Luke 9 and verse 33, if you want to turn back there real quick. Uh, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him in verse 33. And the, as these were leaving him, so Moses and Elijah turned to leave. And that's when Peter says to Jesus, Master, it's good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. And Luke just says he didn't realize what he was saying. You go back to Mark 9 and the honesty here. He didn't know what to answer because they became terrified. And you know what this matches? This matches every time you see an angel show up. This matches every time you see a theophany, a manifestation of God, the person of God in glory. You know how people respond to God when they see him? They're overwhelmed with awe and fear. And the word in Greek here, they became terrified, is a strengthened form of the word that, that means to be afraid. They were, they were super afraid. They were terrified. And the reason that Peter speaks up is not only because he, he can't control himself, he always speaks up, but because he sees Moses and Elijah leaving and he doesn't want it to end. He just slept through all of it. And, and, and they're getting ready to leave. And he says, it's good for us to be here. Uh, how, about, how about we make three uh, uh, booths, one for each of you, and we'll just stay here a while. I promise to stay awake for the rest of the prayer meeting. That's not in there, but that's kind of the idea I get. And I think it's worth noting that you notice the equality with which Peter is offering to treat not only Jesus, but Moses and Elijah. In this context, I think Peter is very clearly recognizing that Jesus, in a manifestation of glory, is on par with Moses and Elijah in their glory. And those are two superheroes from the Old Testament. Notice what happens in verse 7, though. Then a cloud formed overshadowing them and a voice came out of the cloud this is my beloved son listen to him notice how Moses and Elijah fall right out of the picture notice how the father speaks on behalf of the son this happened at his baptism in Mark chapter 1 and verse 11 God the father speaks from heaven and it says a voice came out of he the heavens saying, You are my beloved Son, and you I am well pleased. As Jesus comes up out of the waters of baptism by John the Baptist, the Spirit comes down upon him, and the Father says, You are my beloved Son, in you I am well pleased. What does that testimony mean? It's not only a reference to the identity of Jesus as the Son of God, it is also a testimony from heaven by the Father himself that he is in a perfect relationship with God. And you, I am well pleased. He has lived a sinless, perfect life up to this point. And now on the Mount of Transfiguration, as he is about to head to Jerusalem and offer himself up for us, he again testifies from heaven to the Son and says, This is my beloved Son. Only this time, notice what he says. Listen to him. That's a present imperative, by the way. Keep listening. Listen and keep on listening to him. It's a clear declaration of the, to the authority of Jesus to speak on his behalf. Now, in Matthew 17, now you don't have to turn there, just listen as I read. When this voice is 
stated, we're told that when the disciples heard this, that is the voice, listen to him, the disciples heard it and they fell face down to the ground and were terrified. And Jesus came up to them, touched them and said, get up and don't be afraid. And then lifting up their eyes, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. You come back to Mark 9 and verse 8, you'll see all at once they looked around and saw no one with them anymore except Jesus alone. When the Father spoke, this is my beloved Son, listen to him. By the way, have they been listening to him all the way back through Mark 8 when he starts to tell them, I'm going to Jerusalem, I'm going to be betrayed and rejected, I'm going to be executed, I'm going to die, be buried, and then I'll rise again on the third day? Are they listening to him? No, no. And when he says, uh, if anybody wishes to come after me, he's got to deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Because whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the son will also be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his father with his holy angels. You want to be my disciple? You got to be totally committed to me because my evaluation of you, whether you're one of mine or not, is based on whether or not you're ashamed of me or whether you live for me and and, um, forsake all to follow me in this life or not. And Jesus, uh, uh, the Father clearly says of Jesus, this is my beloved Son, you need to be listening to Him. And they were overwhelmed when they hear the voice of God coming from the cloud. And I don't have time to take you there, but this is, this is like in Exodus, well, f- from, from Exodus 14 through 24, that whole account, when they, when they get out of bondage in Egypt and they go to Mount Sinai, when God shows up, the mountain trembles. When the cloud comes down, there's the lightning and flashing and peals of thunder, etc. Listen, when God shows up, there won't be any shaking your fist at Him. There won't be any objecting to Him. Even, even for these apostles, when God just speaks from the cloud that comes and manifests itself this is this is like in the old testament the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night well this night the cloud came down and god spoke on the father or on the son's behalf and said listen to him and they fell on their faces terrified until jesus comes up and touches them and says don't be afraid and when they look up you'll notice it says all at once this is really cool In Greek, uh, this is the word for suddenly. Normally, you would use a word like immediately, but Mark's been using that repeatedly through the whole gospel. So he changes to this one to make it emphatic. When they looked up, it was just a normal night again. Everybody's gone. Moses is gone. Elijah's gone. The cloud is gone. Uh, We just see Jesus again. The whole glorious experience is over. That's the power of the kingdom of the promised kingdom of God displayed. And now we see it discussed in verses 9 to 13 very quickly. As they're coming down the mountain, so this is this is in the morning. He gave them orders not to relate to anyone what they had seen until the son of man rose from the dead. Now, again, remember, what did the father just say to these guys about the son? Listen to him. And what's the first thing he says? Don't tell anybody about what you saw. And he's repeat many times he's told people not to tell anybody something, right? He told demons not to testify to him because he will not have evil testify to him. Uh, he told the leper when he cleansed him not to tell anybody to first go to Jerusalem so he could be a testimony to the priests. Uh, even recently, as he did miracles to people, he told them not to tell anybody. He sent one guy straight home so that it doesn't become just this mob house of wanting miracles so that he can spend time instructing his disciples. Well, now he tells them not to relate what they had just seen until the Son of Man has risen from the dead. Why? Because if they start telling, and notice this, is, this would include the other disciples. Why did he show them? so that it could be testified to later. Why did he tell them not to tell anybody now? Because if they start telling people now, all the disciples are going to start talking about, oh, he's going to Jerusalem, and he's going to just manifest all that power, and, and it's going to be exactly what we've always thought, and they won't even listen to Jesus at all. You get to verse 10. 
You notice it says they seized upon that statement. They grabbed a hold of that one statement. What statement? (laughs) Until the Son of Man uh, rises from the dead. They seized upon that statement, discussing with one another what rising from the dead meant. Now, maybe you're sitting there going, well, how hard could this be? But think about how many times Jesus spoke figuratively. Think about how many Jesus times Jesus spoke in parables. And rewind a little bit and remember that Jesus just told him point blank, I'm going to Jerusalem, be rejected and be executed and I'll rise again the third day. Even though he told him plainly, no, that can't be, he can't mean what he means. Okay, he can't mean what he's saying. He's got to mean something else. So let's just figure it out. Let's just figure it out. And having just seen this experience in full glory and Moses and Elijah, what what could he mean? What does it mean uh, rising from the dead? And can you imagine them bantering it back and forth uh, between them? Well, finally, they get to the point where They asked him, verse 11, why is it that the scribes say that Elijah must come first? And uh, you can look in the top of your bulletin if you want. But uh, in Malachi 4, the last book in your English Bible, this is the way the prophets close out. Verse 4, remember the law of Moses, my servant, and the statutes and ordinances which I commanded him in Oreb for all of Israel. And behold, pay special attention to this. This is the promise that that the Old Testament basically closes off with. The prophets close off with. I am going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. Elijah is going to come before that great and terrible day of the Lord when he comes to judge the wicked and establish his kingdom. He will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers so that I will not come and smite the land with a curse. And that's exact because that's the way the prophets close off. That's what the scribes are saying. And they were probably saying Jesus can't be the Messiah because Elijah has to come first. That's why, by the way, they asked John the Baptist, are you Elijah? And he said, I'm not. I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness, Isaiah 40. Why is it that the scribes say Elijah has to come first? Well, here's the answer. Verses 12 and 13. He said to them, Elijah does come first and restore all things. Elijah is coming first, and he will restore all things. But here's my question for you. How is it written of the Son of Man that he will suffer many things and be treated with contempt? Why is it that you're paying no attention to the suffering servant passages that I've been trying to point you to all this time? Now, they're going to get it. When you read through Acts 2, you'll see that that Peter's theology is fully formed at that point, and he points back to Psalm 16 and Psalm 110 and Joel, etc., and he lines it all out and says, all of this happened by the predetermined plan of God, and let me prove it to you from the Old Testament. But at this point, he doesn't get it. And that's why Jesus says, Elijah does come first and restore all things. Everything the Old Testament says about Elijah is true, and it's going to happen. Now, the question for you is, how is it written the Son of Man that he will suffer many things and be treated with contempt? Are you missing all that stuff? This is why you're having trouble figuring stuff out. I say to you, verse 13, Elijah has indeed come, and they did to him whatever they wished, just as is written of him, and the implication is, and so too they will do to me. Now, there's not a, a lot of explanation here, but let me just say it this way. When you go through, especially Matthew's gospel, you can see that In Matthew 11 and Matthew 17, Jesus fully develops the idea of John the Baptist being the fulfillment of Elijah in preparation for his coming and having been rejected because he says, if you will accept it. Now, I would take that to mean that uh, John the Baptist was One who came in the spirit and power of Elijah. And he announced the coming of the Messiah. And he was rejected and they did whatever they wanted to him. Just like the the nation of Israel rejected Elijah and did whatever they wanted to him. And so too they did to the Messiah and they'll do whatever they want to him. But I, I think when Malachi, in Malachi 4, the promise of a coming Elijah. And the fact that Christ came the first time to suffer and die for us. And will come the next time to establish his kingdom. I think the, probably the best way to connect those dots is 
Yes, John came in the spirit and power of Elijah, but Elijah's still coming, and Christ is going to come again, and the next time he comes, it's going to be with power, and he's going to establish his kingdom. And when Elijah comes the next time, it's probably Elijah himself. I think it's going to be literal. And he's going to turn the hearts of Israel to recognize their Messiah when he comes. And all the Zechariah promises will be fulfilled. They will look on me whom they have pierced. Is he one of the two witnesses? I think that's the best guess, but I guess we'll see. In the meantime, what do we learn from all of this? I think, I think that, number one, you can see that the kingdom is going to come with power. And if you're one of God's people, you'll be in it and you'll be glorified. Just like you see Moses and Elijah glorified and interacting in the flesh, still as who you are, but a glorified version of you with Jesus Christ in full glory. When Jesus calls us to deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow him, that's a, that's a call for total commitment, right? But that total commitment is securing for us a promise of glory that is as sure as the manifestation of the glory that the apostles saw on the Mount of Transfiguration. When you see Christ again, that's the Christ you will see. Glory and power and majesty. And if you're one of his people, you'll be a glory right in front of him. And if you're not, you'll instead face his wrath. Let's pray. Father in heaven, praise, honor, and glory be to you. Thank you for the glimpse of glory that you have given to us in the person of your son. Not only in the way he lived a perfect sinless life in front of all of mankind to see, the way he was perfectly obedient to you all the way up to and through death on a cross, Thank you also for the, the glimpse of the glorious future that is in store, not just for him and not just for the disciples, but for all of us who will, who will be part of it because of the work that you have done in our hearts and lives and the way that you have drawn us to yourself. Thank you for the certainty of your word, how clear and reliable are your promises, and how majestic is your name. May we never forget that you are a God that is worthy of our worship and also our obedience. And we pray you will help us to live for you and to point to you until you return for us or call us home. In Jesus' name, amen.